Hi. Um, so first, I'd like to say um, thank you to Francis Marion University for having me here. Um, I'm very happy to be here. This is only the second time, I think, that I've been in South Carolina. Um, and um, I love it. It's a beautiful place. So I'm just you know, happy that y'all gave me an excuse to come back and, uh, and, and, and experience it. So uh, with that, um, I'll begin. When I was a child, books were my escape. I'm sure that this is the case for most writers. I anticipated the coming of the book fair the way all the other children looked forward to our local church fair, which featured game booths and easily breakable plastic toys. My mother, who worked variously as a maid throughout my childhood, never had extra money to give me to buy books at the book fair or to order books from a scholastic newsletter. So I was jealous when I watched other kids buy their books and I admired their purchases while I continued to borrow mine from the library. When I took the books that I borrowed home, I sat on the bottom bunk I shared with my brother and I read for hours. The books that I loved the most resembled each other closely. The main protagonist was usually a girl. See, she was usually a little odd, quirky, misunderstood, or something of an outcast, like Mary in The Secret Garden or Claudia in From the Mixed Up Files of Mrs. Bosley Frank Wheeler, or her appearance marked her as other and isolated her from those around her, from those in her community. Like Aaron in The Hero in the Crown, or Cassie in Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry. In each of the books that I loved, these girls were complex, unique people who went on quests. Whether they were trying to find their way into a secret garden in the rural English countryside, or battling dragons in the rolling hills of invented countries named Damar, I was enthralled. Part of what enthralled me so was that their environments were so otherworldly. This was true even if the places they roamed existed on maps of this world. Their worlds and adventures were so alien to my own experience that they fascinated me. And I read whole days away as I hid from the heat or my mother or my father or some other grown up in my life. The girl protagonists in those books were more familiar than the worlds that they inhabited. Even as a child, I was aware that in some ways, they reminded me of myself. I knew that I was something of an outcast, an underdog, that I often felt alienated by the world around me as I came into my own small personhood. I also knew even then that I was wrestling with something so much greater than I was, even as the protagonist that I loved were wrestling with things so much greater than they were. When I fell in love with reading, my father and mother had had to resort to moving back into my grandmother's four bedroom house in DeLille, Mississippi. 13 of us lived in that house. My grandmother, her four sons, who were all in their 20s, her three daughters, who were also in their 20s, my father, me, my brother, my younger sisters, and my first cousin. It was the first and last time I would live in one house with so many people that I loved. The bunk bed I read in was in a larger back bedroom where my brother and I, both my aunts, and my first cousin slept. We were poor and we were crowded. By the time my nuclear family moved out of my grandmother's house and into our own house, my mother and my father had separated and two years later they would divorce, which left my mother to raise four kids on her own. She was only 28 and she left her job as a hotel maid and became a private maid for local rich white families in order to support us. When I was 12, the family that my mother, my mother cleaned for offered me a chance to attend a local private Episcopalian school. This school population was mostly white and wealthy. For years during my junior high and high school careers, I was the only black girl in the entire school. It was a hard experience. I liked the school because I had great one-on-one -on -one interaction with teachers, the classes were small, but being the only poor black girl in a school where the majority of the children were white and wealthy was difficult. I had a few close friends in that school, most of them outcasts for one reason or another. They were overweight or underweight, or they came from poor families, or they liked to wear black and loved countercultures and listened to bands no one had ever heard of. Many of the students in that school had a clear sense of entitlement. Many of them were insensitive, and some of them 
were racist. The racist kids were definitely the hardest to live with. They threatened me with lynching in the halls. They talked in horror about the fact that they would never kiss a black person because our lips were too big and that was gross. They argued with me that there are genetic reasons that black people are good at basketball. They believed that it was okay to qualify, to qualify black woman's attractiveness by saying, pretty for a black girl. One of them asked me to put nigger braids in her hair. Another sat on my desk while I was taking a test and told nigger jokes for a full five minutes while the teacher was out of the classroom and then dared me to object. I had secret dreams of being a writer then. I wrote stories about fallen angels and, and cello prodigies. They weren't good. Most of them suffered from weak plots, non-existent character development, and poorly executed figurative language. They were cliche written and short. Even though I knew I was failing at creative writing, I kept trying. It was as if I intuitively knew that creative writing could help me express something ineffable about how I'd grown up, about where I came from, about who I thought I was, about how and what I saw in the world, about me. So I continued to write, but I was frustrated for years. I couldn't understand that art doesn't always have to be about experiences so alien to my own to be interesting. I didn't understand that I could find inspiration in my own experience and write about that and that people would want to read about it. I'd internalized the racist kids litany at school, the dismissiveness I encountered in the outside world because I was young and black and poor and a girl and I didn't believe that anything about my experience was worth exploring, worth writing about. It wasn't until I sat down to write my college entrance essays that I wrote something about my family and my community, which at the time was mostly black, mostly poor and working class, crack ridden and rural. When I wrote that essay, it felt important because for the first time I was writing about myself and those closest to me. I was making a statement. We are here, I said, and this is what life is like for us. And then this is who I am, and finally, hear me. For the first time, I wasn't using literature to escape my life. I was using literature to explore it. It was an important epiphany for me. I could write something that readers found compelling and engaging, and it could be about me and my experience and the experiences of those in my community. There was pain in it, but the beauty that I found in writing about it surprised me and it thrilled me. After I saw this, I knew that from then on, I wouldn't avoid my community when I searched for inspiration, but instead, I would draw from it. And perhaps I was motivated by a certain amount of anger, anger at the historic, historical injustices that I was learning about in my own reading, in addition to the personal injustices I suffered at the hands of my classmates. My anger was sudden and fierce. It mobilized me and inspired me. Suddenly, I wanted every one of the kids I went to high school with the kids who sat on my desk and told nigger jokes or raised their hands in class and asked our teachers where black people came from. I wanted those kids to read my work, read about people like the people that I came from, the people that I grew up with, and see us as human beings. When I chose to pursue writing after I graduated from college and shortly after my younger brother, then 19, died in a car accident when he was hit by a drunk driver, I wasn't rising above the expectations of my family. If anything, I was disappointing them. My mother, who was mother and father to me for so many years after my father left, was disappointed that I intended a top-notch university and chose to pursue a career in writing. She felt that I should aspire to study something more practical, like medicine or law. She always said that if she were given the chance to start all over again, she would study to be an undertaker. People are always going to die, she said. I was horrible at math, so I gave up on studying medicine early. But I was better at reader, reading and writing, so I flirted with studying law until my brother's death. And then, on a plane one day, I asked myself, if this plane crashed and you died, what would you have done that would make you proud of how you lived? What can make you happy you live while your brother doesn't? And I immediately thought, writing. Then I committed to applying to MFA programs in fiction, to learning the craft, to apprenticing myself to better, older writers. Even though I'd been pretty successful 
in my young career, my mother sometimes thinks that I should return to school to study nursing. She distrusts the profession of writing, I think, and publishing. She spent years cleaning up after other people, worked her way to an early diagnosis of arthritis so I could have the luxury of picking up a pen. In her eyes, I think, a steadier profession would be more worthy of her sacrifice. My mother's practical, after all. She thinks that people are always gonna sue each other and they're always gonna get sick. She's right, of course. Culture predicts one, human biology another. This residue of familial disapproval hurts, of course. It adds its tenor to the chorus I hear inside my head, that chorus that most writers and artists hear that doubts the work. We all feel inadequate when faced with a blank page, a white camp canvas, a silent instrument. Will what I create have any merit? Will anyone else want to read it or look at it or listen to it? Can I do this once? Once done, can I do it again? And will the end result be worth the effort? Writing is complicated. You love it intensely. You want it to succeed and bring beauty into the world, to grow and reveal some amazing truths. But you must battle self-doubt and negative introspection every letter, every punctuation mark, every space. I hear the voice of self-doubt, of disapproval, when my book isn't selling or I get negative constructive feedback from my peers or my work is rejected by a publisher. I don't argue with that voice, at least not out loud, that would be crazy. But I do ignore that voice, the same way that I ignored the negative voices of my peers in high school when I was a budding writer. Instead, I always return to the compulsion I feel to write. Even though I've tried to stop writing multiple times in my life and focus on more practical professions, the compulsion, the need to express myself in language always pulled me back. In addition, the love I feel for my community, the responsibility I feel to tell our stories and to tell them well pulled me back. These are the things that muffle that negative voice a bit that drive me to sit down, open my computer, and begin. But there are other fears to grapple with, of course. Much of what I write about is informed by what I see around me. There is much about what I see in my community that demands a sort of brutal honesty, a willingness to write the hard things. I encountered this problem in my debut novel, and I was not able to surmount it. In my debut novel, Where the Line Bleeds, two teenage boys, twins, graduate high school and attempt to find work to support their disabled grandmother. One of the boys is able to find legitimate work, while the other is not. This other twin turns to selling drugs in order to survive. As the summer progresses, the twin's family unravels. Their crackhead father comes back to town to haunt them. Their absent mother returns to taunt them. Most of the negative feedback I received about the novel after it was written concerned what happens to the brothers. They should fall farther, I heard, suffer more, my peers said. But I couldn't do it. They reminded me so clearly of cousins and friends I grew up with, of my own brother, that I couldn't hurt my characters. I couldn't bring myself to let the narrative have them, let the story tell itself. Instead, I hugged them to my chest, pulled my authorial punches. The story couldn't take on a life of its own because the love that I felt for my characters was stifling it. So in some ways, I failed when I wrote my first book. But trying and failing taught me an important lesson. When I was writing my second novel, Salvage the Bones, I realized I had to be more honest about the realities of the community I was writing about. At home, a lot of my older relatives were addicted to crack. The introduction of casinos to the coast was encouraging other addictive proclivities to gambling, to alcohol. After my brother died in the fall of 2000, four young black men from my community died in the next four years from suicide, drug overdose, murder, and auto accidents. This meant I lost five young men in four years, all in unnatural ways. My brother and my friends who died were all from my small rural community, which was so opposite of where most people thought these epidemics occurred. 
As I lived through and learned how to write with those losses, I realized that my family and my community's present losses weren't happening in some sort of vacuum. There were larger reasons, like poverty and racism and economic inequality, pressures that have exerted themselves viciously in the South that enabled these awful events. This was even clearer to me when Hurricane Katrina hit the Mississippi Gulf Coast in August of 2005. My family and I survived Hurricane Katrina, but we had to fight to do so. We left my grandmother's flooding house during the storm. We were separated when our cars were swept away by the rush of the storm surge sweeping up through the bay and throughout the town. Me and my pregnant sister swam through the floods to higher ground. My other sister and my nephews were rescued by a good Samaritan in a boat. Part of my family, which consisted of my pregnant sister, my elderly grandparents, my mother, stepfather, and myself, we were refused shelter by a white family during the storm who told us, we don't have any room for you in the house, but you can sit in your truck in this field until the storm passes. So we sheltered in our trucks in an open field in a Category 5 hurricane. Many of our houses were flooded or suffered wind damage so badly that they had to be substantially rebuilt. That experience meant I saw the entire town of Paskristan demolished, people fighting over water, breaking open caskets in search of something that could help them survive. This is how history bears in the present. This is the reality of my home, and I learned that if I was going to assume the responsibility of writing about that home, then I couldn't afford to dull the edges, to soften the narrative, to fall in love with my characters and spare them like some benevolent god. Life does not spare us. Writing about Hurricane Katrina, about the kind of community I'm from, requires integrity, a narrative ruthlessness. If I'm gonna honor my family and community with my words, I have to be honest. And I have to be foolish enough to think I can do it well. And I have to be brave enough to confront tragedy and pull some sort of redemption from it, at least narratively. My creative process usually begins with knowing the ending of whatever I'm working on. When I sit down or drive or walk in order to find inspiration, the inspiration I find is usually an image of the end, of whatever I'll write. It may seem weird, but the end situation of the book is what intrigues me enough to, com to commit to diving in and making it into a story. Once I have an image of the end, I then set about to drive or walk some more so that I can get a better handle on who the characters are. I don't have to know everything about them. I don't have to know what their favorite breakfast food is or what their greatest fear is. But I knew, do need to know one vital aspect of their personality. What motivates them? What drives them to get up in the morning and walk through their lives? When I found the idea for Where the Line Bleeds, it was the confrontation between the twins and their father at the end that snagged me. When I found the idea for Salvage the Bones, I saw a girl, young Esh, who grows up lonely in a family full of men. Skeeta, her older brother, and China, his beloved pit bull, struggling to survive the hurricane. This inspired me to write. And what I knew about those characters when I began writing was simple, too. I knew that both twins in my first book wanted to make something of themselves, yearned to at once honor the responsibilities they felt for their families and yet to escape them. At the beginning of Salvage the Bones, I knew that Skeeter loved his dog and his family and that Esh was a girl growing up in a world full of men, which meant she loved and resented her family all at once. This was all I knew. But once I have some idea of the ending and a vague idea of who my characters are, my task is to enter, enter the narrative at the best moment. This is the beginning of the novel. My next task is to write toward that end, whatever it may be. Along the way, the characters gain lives of their own and surprise me in the course of getting to that ending image, but they always end up at the moment I saw for them at the beginning of the novel. The hardest part for me, of course, is to silence the voice of self-doubt and then sit down and wrestle with the material, to put words to paper. 
And then the second hardest part, especially when I'm writing about experiences that mirror my own closely, like surviving Hurricane Katrina or the deaths of my brother and our friends, is to sit with the pain of experience. This is, is especially painful in creative nonfiction, in memoir. How does one look at one's life and confront pain? Look at it squarely, honestly, brushing aside shame and grief and write about it. I've been working on a memoir about my dead brother and my dead friends, and I've had to go back to that work again and again. And each time, I must be less evasive. I must not only write about what happened, but I must give it perspective. And in the end, I have to find the story in the situation. I have to find beauty. I have to find meaning, because that's one of the most important things that surfaces from my commitment to telling these stories. Meaning appears, and beauty, and the pain and grief of living these realities becomes a little less senseless for me and my community who sees themselves reflected in my work, in my characters. It's not easy. It never is. When I wrote the hurricane scenes in Salvage the Bones, I felt as if I were reliving the experience. I became a hermit, ate all my food out of cans for two weeks. I felt stranded. It felt as if I were reliving the hurricane all over again, experiencing the sense of terror and desolation and hopelessness and despair all over again. Right now, I'm working on a memoir about my brother and the four young men from my community who died right after my brother. This is the most painful thing I've ever written. And the pain seems to escalate as the book progresses. I break every day when I'm writing. The grief that I feel at their loss is multiplied as I relive our lives together on paper, as they live for me again, chapters at a time, and then leave. And not only do I have to write through this pain, I also have to find meaning in their short lives, their brutal deaths. I have to find the story that links them to one another and me, the why of this epidemic of young black men in the rural South dying one after another, and I have to be honest about it. Ultimately, I have to say the hard things about history and racism and the South and personal and public accountability. This is a great responsibility, but one I don't think I could live without. If I weren't able to find meaning in my artistic work, how could I find meaning in my personal life? In the end, this is what I think is necessary to express myself as an artist. This is what I think is necessary to write with purpose. I also think it's a necessary characteristic of those who are resilient, who rise above hardship in their lives. One must possess a sense of meaning. When the BP rig blew and oil began pouring into the Gulf of Mexico, I followed the news. I talked to people at home. I heard their stories about the smell of oil, saw the skinny booms for myself, felt the sense of dread at this new catastrophe, catastrophe fresh on the heels of the catastrophe of Hurricane Katrina. There was a sense that we'd felt as if we were beginning to recover from Katrina, and yet here again was another tragedy. At home, people say, I felt like I was just getting up on my feet, and then something else came along and knocked me back down. This is a common refrain, and it applies to great tragedies and lesser tragedies. And after that leak was plugged and the oil stopped flowing, the people of the Mississippi Gulf Coast began to rebuild. We applied to work as members of cleanup crews and applied for assistance. We did what we could to see around the catastrophe to begin working towards standing up on our own two feet again. But in order to do so, we had to believe that there was meaning in what we did, meaning in our future. In Salvage the Bones, the characters find meaning and purpose in each other. This is what makes Skeeter fight for and with China. This is what makes Esh salvage food and resources for her family after the storm. And when the reader encounters these characters, my hope is that he or she is able to see that Esh and her family find meaning in their struggle when they find hope and purpose in one another. That they are always engaged in the struggle to salvage what they can 
from what they've been given. As Esh's grandfather does, as Esh's father does after his wife dies, and as Esh and her siblings do during the course of the book. Their stories are emblematic of the community, of the region, of a people who have historically been told that they are expendable, less than human, unnecessary. In my memoir, Men We Reaped, I find meaning in my friends' short lives and senseless deaths. As in real life, this is hardest to do when I write about my brother and my family's grief at his loss. I've struggled through multiple drafts of this memoir, and I will probably work my way through more before I'm satisfied with what I've written, with what I've expressed. But in every draft, I find more layers of meaning, more beauty, more truth. I learn that my brother was actively engaged with his life, that he was struggling to answer the big questions that I write about in my memoir about race and poverty and history, that he was seeing the way race and poverty and history and his gender bore down on his personal life. And he was attempting to figure them out in order to figure out how to navigate them before he died. I found out that my brother was able to look at all that pain and grief and hardship inherent in life and see beauty in the smallest of things, whether they were hunks of wax melted to look like amber or uncommon songs or silly movies. While writing my memoir, I've learned that my brother was no different than I am and that he also yearned to find meaning and truth and beauty in life. Suddenly, all that I had assumed about what it meant to be an artist was simplified. And I realized that to search for beauty and truth, to wrest meaning from life, is human. It's essential. It's why human beings need music, need writing, need art. To assess our experience and find meaning in it and to express that in some way is what it means to be a human being. This is what it means to look up in the sky at a brilliant spate of stars and wonder and hypothesize about your place in it. This is what it means to pick up a guitar and sound out a tune that resonates with your heartbeat, your sadness, your strength. This is what it means to draw with chalk on a dim cave wall. This is what it means to live. When I settled on the title for Salvage the Bones, one of the reasons I was so invested in using the word salvage is because it is so close phonetically to the word savage. At home, among the young, there is honor in claiming that term, in declaring yourself a savage. It denotes resiliency, resourcefulness, and courage. It tells the listener that come hell or high water, Katrina or oil spill, hunger or heat, you are strong, you are fierce, you possess the hope inherent in knowing life is worth fighting for. When you stand on a beach after a hurricane, the asphalt ripped from the earth beneath you, gas stations, homes, and grocery stores disappeared, oak trees uprooted, without any of the comforts of civilization, no electricity, no running water, no government safety net to provide any sort of social order or resources. And all you have are your hands, your feet, your head, and your resolve to fight because your family depends on you. You do the only thing you can. As Esh says in Salvage the Bones, and then I get up because it is the only thing I can do. I step out of the ditch and brush the ants off because it is the only thing I can do. I follow Randall around the house because it is the only thing I can do. If this is strength, this is weakness, this is what I do. You are a savage. You salvage the bones of your experience, canned goods, the husk of a house, the memory of your brother's life, of your friend's deaths, and you create meaning. You make a future from it. You tell your story. You survive. Thank you.